I want to thank the association for giving me the opportunity to engage over the last year. And more importantly, to thank my wife, Gladys. 25 years, 14 days ago, it seems like yesterday. Thank you for allowing me to do this wonderful work. I also want, yes. I'm also blessed to have two wonderful children, Christian and Alex, my sons, and my mother, Alice, and my sister, Nancy, with me tonight. It's wonderful to have your family celebrate in such a wonderful, joyous occasion like this. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank my home institution, NYU, NYU, my, left and my right and my left hands, Neil and Kate, for your work, for allowing me to do this. Thank you both very much. My boss is watching the feed on this, so Mark, thank you very much. You're the guy. I appreciate it. Last year, as we were ready to depart Washington, D.C., I vowed to learn from our members about your issues, your concerns, and your ideas about this profession, student housing accommodations and residence life. From my first chat with the University of North Texas in the hotel lobby of the Wardman to my last chat at, with my Ferris State University colleague just last Wednesday, whether I was sitting on a boat, I really was, talking to people on the phone, driving in a car with my headset, walking the streets of New York City, sitting at my desk, or face to face in Washington, New Orleans, Columbus, Ohio, Rome, Australia, North Dakota, Worcester, Mass, New York City, or here in Orlando, or over Skype at home, I learned about this profession and the needs of you, our members. Overall, I completed 752 contacts covering over 720 institutions. Some schools had different people call me, so I got to add some to that number. I spoke with individuals and groups of people. Humboldt State had 45 people in the room to talk to me on that afternoon. And I spoke with over 975 people total. And I had a few colleagues that helped me. The region with the most responses to talk to was Niakuho with 94% of your members. Akuho had 92%, so next time I had to go back to Australia to get the rest of them. What did I learn? Of course, there were nu numerous aha moments, great one-offs like creating a searchable database or offering training modules for our Kuho I internship host sites or offering V roundtable discussions for our international colleagues, which what we did this year. These were some of the, the quick ideas. Then there was a list of things that I said, we already do these things for our members. Somehow we need to re-educate our folks on how to make sure you update your membership list. Lots of great things, but in the little time I have tonight, I'm gonna to focus on the top 10 of things that I learned. Number one, data. Where is it? While we are all very busy, we need to commit to making assessment and research a part of our daily work. During a recent discussion I had with Nathaniel Tuck, our chair of NACUR, and the other leaders in North Dakota, I noted to them that they should hold us their residence, life, and housing student accommodations officers accountable to answering these questions for them. Why should a student live in housing and not off campus? What is the return on investment for resident students? What are the reasons grounded in data for it? What learning do we know to happen for the, in the residence halls? And what are the best methods for us to identify, improve what is happening? How does physical design impact learning and what should we be building? What's the best way we can support our students with mental illness in residence? And when we don't have intentional interventions, what is the impact on the rest of the residential community? These were the top questions that you told me you wanted us to research. Imagine a Fortune 500 company not having the brand information about their product and surviving. If we don't get these answers, how will we survive? And with our data collection, how can we use our doctoral students and our faculty partners in higher ed to answer these questions? Thanks to Paul Yar and Dawn Johnson, we're moving on that right track, a track we should never allow to be removed from our profession. Number two, good, better, and best. How do we respond to a natural disaster, offer, offer gender neutral housing, or handle unknown damages in the halls, or develop new protocols? or you get the idea. 
What I've learned is how eager so many of you are to know emulating practices and how can we categorize them and keep them alive for others to view. Something we can provide to our supervisors when they knock on the door for answers. Storing our practices and policies and data so our members can view 24 seven. Number three, some of the new legislation in the United States impacting our campuses seems to be written by people who don't understand the negative impact on our students. The Affordable Care Act limits us by requiring us to provide full-time benefits to student employees over the summer. But due to budget constraints, this law may limit how many students we can hire. The expectations for Title IX are not completely clear, and whomever is interpreting the laws may not be in full line with the law. Where's the clarity? What role should we be playing in relation to weapons on campus, minors on campus, or the latest legislation in Pennsylvania, fingerprinting of all volunteers in residence halls? What about legislation and regulations in Canada, Australia, and the UK, to name a few? Where is our knowledge base for our institutions around the globe, and how much emphasis can we place on this association to be the organization to advocate for states, nations, and countries? Advocacy and legislation voice, legislative voice is something our members feel is needed for a QOI as demonstrated in the business meeting this morning. Number four, physical environments. I've often heard that scientists believe that is either nurture or nature, genes or environment that is the biggest influence on who we are and our motivation. Well, if that's true, we know we can't aff affect the genes, but yes, we can affect the environment. How are we building our residence halls? What data do we have to determine it is a best fit for the goals of our institution, say they are providing to our students? Number five, soft skills for students. When I attended the IASIS NASPA Global Summit in Rome, the issue of developing soft skills for students was paramount to our European communities. When I returned to the States, it was not surprising that I started to hear a similar refrain. And then when in Brisbane, Australia for Akuho, it was repeated a third time. Our students of today need engagement, personal outreach and skill building. How much energy do we put into that? Last year, I challenged the directors of all programs around the globe to commit to meeting individually with your student staff for personal one-on-one -on -one chats. Since my first phone call, 30 directors have emailed or called me and told me they have started doing the same on their campus. I applaud each of the 30. And after meeting with over 1,870 RAs on my campus individually in the past nine years, I know how I have changed and reframed my practice. I once again encourage each director to join in this connection to our most valuable and important resource, our students who frame community among their peers. For the residents, we need to think about skill building and create models that can be shared amongst their peers. We have such an opportunity to impact the future. How will we get more leaders to spend time cultivating the next generation of our leaders in this field? So how we engage rather than how we program for students is what I heard most important from many of you. Creating a study on what makes a great RA is something we need to invest in how to train them, select them, and determine the entering characteristics that we need for RAs. We should and we can do this, working through our research committee, supported by research dollars, bringing practitioners in our team to do this work together. Number six, regional relationships. Surprising at first, I learned that more than 60% of those I spoke to in a 10-minute chat did not know that the regions in a KUHOI are not formally connected as one umbrella organization. I learned that we may have, we have many overlapping goals, but I learned we haven't really discussed how we can best partner our knowledge for our members in the betterment of our profession. Is there a place for the regions in a KUHOI to share data, competencies, and administrative support? I believe so, and I'm most happy a work group has been established to start this discussion. This discussion is not about structure or membership. It is rather, it is about how all of the associations can improve the professional student accommodations and residence life world. Thank you to the group of 21 plus 
our ex officio, Joanne Goldwater from the E-Board, who over the next 18 months will be presenting a series recommendation, which each group can determine what they choose to enact or not. These recommendations will suggest how the regions in Akuhoi can best support the betterment of our profession. Number seven, partnerships with companies building facilities. While there may not be much agreement among all of us in this room about our feelings on public-private partnerships, known to many as P3s, after what has happened in the US, in Georgia, in Kentucky, and been happening for quite a long time in Canada, Australia, and the UK, our field has and will continue to evolve. In fact, in some of our affiliates, P3s are full members of some regions. I believe we shouldn't have a reason to fear change. Unless we, are, uh, unless we are not held to the Akuhoi standards which we have embraced in the accommodations world. The more we advocate and insist on standards and educate students and their guardians to mandate institutions to have standards, then the playing field will be leveled. How will you, the member, want your association to move on this issue? Stay tuned for more information in the coming months. Number eight. I learned we need to continue to diversify our volunteer leadership. The work of the networks to invite, engage, and show ways leadership matters needs to be our daily work. As one of the panelists, Dr. Stephen Harris, so eloquently noted yesterday, just take action. There's a time for talk, now we will act. This advocacy needs to also include our international institutions and small school reps. We need each of you to volunteer and take on leadership, and we need to ensure when you do serve that we assist you in being successful. A wonderful year-long project led by Alvin Sturdivant started asking the question as to why and how a Kuhoi could look at our climate for staff of color to better understand why and how we get staff of color to be involved. These are very complicated but critically important issues and questions, and I'm confident that the data collected from his work will be a wonderful rollout for the action. Number nine, the I in Akuho I. Having attended four professional events hosted on non-US soil over the past three years, Toronto, England, Rome, and Brisbane, Australia, I've had the chance to learn how important this issue is for all of us. We all share some of the same challenges, but we don't necessarily share the same nomenclature. We need to listen and be cognizant that student housing accommodations is the business we all share in common. European institutions are far ahead of many US institutions in service delivery. Australia integrates international students and provides the small college feel that US programs would be envious to have. Canadian colleagues provide outstanding quality engagement among students and strong collaborators. And I could go on with Mexico and South Africa as well. So yes, U.S., we have so much in common with our international colleagues. Pastoral care, wellness issues for our students. Faculty integration, building sustainable facilities, and hiring competent staff. And also, much to learn from our colleagues. North, east, south, and west. It can't be us, U.S., thinking we are the ones with practices to be emulated. Learning goes both ways. And we need to ensure we develop mechanisms to demonstrate the great work around the globe. We also need to know the best practices and services that the globe can share with each other. And finally, we need to look at our international colleagues as viable candidates for all of our executive board positions in the future. So I am grateful to Glenn Wepler, who will lead the Global Initiatives Network's new charge and supported by the talented Colin Marshall from our board to create a review of all the leaders of each country around the globe and what practices need to be promoted from the membership. And number 10, thank you. And number 10, a KUOI is about relationships. We are a finicky field, a field that has members less than two connections apart from each other, which is good and it's challenging. It becomes easy for us to call a colleague when we have an issue. And now with the Akuhoi online tool engagement, it's easy to post a question and store the answers forever. In our relationship building, we need not forget about the largest percentage of member institutions of Akuhoi, small schools. 
We need to continue to mentor and connect to institutions who don't have the finances to attend our in-person conferences and workshops, but yearn for the best ways to do our work to help students. It's a robust group who needs our attention. And finally, we can't forget, we are a volunteer organization, which means the list I just shared with you that I got from you, we need you to help make this list go smaller. While there are hired employees in the home office who I greatly respect, their job is to support our strategic initiatives and directions. But the staff in this field need to provide the expertise to answer these questions and issues. We need you to be the next one. I'd encourage those here and those who could not attend to try to give back 5% of your time this year to your professional association. Seems like a lot, but it's not. Find a way to do it and we will benefit in the long run. So that is a high level review of what I learned from you, our members. With my own experience, I learned that a Kuhoi has ways for members to find their passion and to give it back. I listed a number for you and I so that we can give back. As I leave this role and know the leaders to follow me, such as Alan Latner, Beth McCuskey, and Deb Schmidt Rogers, I know what great hands this association has leading us into the future. Additionally, Mary De Niro, our new chief officer for operationalizing our goals, is fabulous. And I know she will be at all of the regional conferences in the next year and a half, so look for her, forward to having her there. So, what will I be doing now that my term is over? Well, I'm working with two volunteers on my campus to produce a final report with all the information collected, and hopefully by September you'll get a copy. And hopefully uh, you'll find what you wrote in there, but it's in aggregate form, no, dis no identifiable disclaimer there. After that, who knows? A KUHOI will always have another project that warrants some of my free time. But now that my term is over, I know I've learned as much as my mind could possibly absorb. Now, let's reflect on our last few days together with some reminders of the 2015 annual conference and exposition, and of course, one more selfie before we start dinner. <laughs> Enjoy dinner. <laughs>